The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Hi there, and welcome to Sonic Society Season 12, Episode 499. I'm your host, counting backwards on my fingers, Jack Wood. (laughs) And I'm the host, who can do all the maths in his head, David Alt. Uh, Jack, (laughs) is this uh, handsomely digital reference about next week's extravaganza? Oh, the puns. I love it. Yes, David. (laughs) We'll have our 500th episode looming in the distance now, and a little retrospective thought is certainly on my mind at this time, as well as when did digits stop being used? to describe fingers and become something of a more ephemeral matter, do you know? Oh, wow, I have no idea. Although, for a long time, zero wasn't even a number. Oh, I do remember that, yeah. Yes. It was, it, that was it, like a huge mathematical leap forward. Absolutely. It's like, I've got yes. one, but I don't have none. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. fascinating. Yeah, it's why you've got the natural numbers, which start at one, mm-hmm. and then integers will include zero and the negative numbers right. because you know, there's no such thing as a zero and, and what's this minus one of which you speak yeah that must have been a big jump too do you know Absolutely. when we got into like the minus numbers at all not off the top of my head but i would say <laughs> it's probably arabia or the the arabic numbers or oh no was it a french math i don't know but anyway the two zeros that we're most focused on is the two zeros at the end of the five <laughs> so That's next for sure. yes because next week is the 500th regular season oh. episode Episode. So please get out there and send us your memories, thoughts, favourite times or episodes to sonicsociety at gmail.com. Not to mention our 700 <laughs> all-around episode including Summer Sessions, Summer Seasons, Sonic Echo, Sonic Speaks and of course the Biff Straker Extras. <sighs> but now we've got a jam-packed episode. Indeed we do. Beginning with part two of Survivors, a promotional release of episode one from the Big Finish Amazing series and then the episode Subject Found, episode two from Fate Crafters and Paul Sating. Right here on the Sonic Society. We just lost Mr. and Mrs. Kavagoff. Clive's got the fever. Less than 30 left out of what? 150? (laughs) I've been staring out that window all afternoon. Just keep your lookout. What is it they say about a watched pot? Now, the the food and water situation. John, what is it? Miss Price, when I did my rounds first thing, I saw someone out there, driving across the runways. And you didn't think to let me know? They were in unmarked Land Rovers. Several armed passengers, shotguns, no uniforms. They didn't appear in any way official. Even so, you should have told me, for God's sakes, at least... What's that? A plane? It is! A plane! Wait! Oh, <laughs> a fantastical dream, huh? They're coming to help! No! No! What the... They missed the runway! It wasn't heading for the runway. I don't think they'd any say in where they were heading. What do you mean? It's going to... Stay here, Miss Price. No. Oh, but we need to get out there. Do something. Uh, no! Stay here! Everybody! Get away from the windows! John, I want it! It was leaking fuel! now. Diane? Simon? Is anyone there? Helen? I'm not leaving you. I'm just going to see if I can find someone. I'll just be along the corridor. I won't go far. You rest. I'll be right back. Thank you for trying. Hello? Is someone there? Keep away! Are you a nurse? Have you seen any doctors? Stay away from me. You can't stop me. I need these pills. You can't stop me taking them. Please! Come back! I wasn't going to... 
What are they? Antibiotics? Painkillers? Here. In here. There. The, the heating's working and there's no damage. Good. Thank you, Miss Price. Uh, those who are able should move on through to the bar area. Okay, what about the ones by the window? Uh, there was nothing we could do. We're not an emergency department. The first aid kits are only good for cuts and bruises. Okay, out there, the, the, the people on the plane... Do you got... really think anyone survived? We're safer inside. Don't you agree? Well, who were they? Where did they come from? It was small, a private carrier, perhaps. <laughs> we're unlikely to ever find well, out. But why did it crash? Well, I can't be certain, but the fuel leak... I think it may have been attacked. But you don't mean that... Oh, come on. We should go check. Uh, Not while men with guns are roaming the area. We were lucky we weren't spotted. I located some more medication from the chemist's storerooms. (laughs) But we can't just get... (coughs) Oh, why? Oh, no, no. no. Sit down. I'll fetch some soda water from the bar, then I'll help you through. Take these for the pain and fever. No, no, keep the bottle. Oh. You may as well take this one, too. <coughs> After all, uh. there are so few of us left. <coughs> I've got everything else. As much as I could carry. I think this is a stock list. We can work out what they all are and... And then see if uh, anything on here tells us which are the best ones to... Helen? I don't know what else to do. Water. You'll need water, too. When you wake up. I'll get some. Later. I couldn't wake them up. Martin and Diane were on the sofa huddled under a blanket. They weren't breathing. I couldn't wake them up. They looked so scared, clinging together like it might just keep them alive. I found Simon upstairs in his bunk bed, all alone. I guess he must have been the first. Oh, Helen, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't. Hells? No. Please, God, no. Please? Is anyone there? Can anybody help me? It's ready, I think. You think? <clears throat> um, short wave only. Give us the best range. How far? Don't know, a couple of miles? Maybe more? But do we want to waste power trying to get... It's a question of allocating resources to the best ends possible. (coughs) Thank you, Lewis. You've done well. (coughs) Thanks, Dr. Gillis. See what you can find in Nurse's office. Yes, sir. Get some rest. Uh, Thank you, sir. This is Dr. James Gillison. Can anybody hear me? Miss Price! Wait! Please! Where are you going? The wreck burned itself out. There's nobody out there. Been quiet all night. Well, I can still walk. I'm going to take a look at the other terminal. Miss Price, I don't... (laughs) Where did you get those keys? Your guards are all gone, John. Amazing how fast you get used to searching dead bodies. (laughs) There. I'm going. I forbid you to step through those doors. Forbid? On whose authority? I am a United States citizen. We stopped taking any notice of you telling us what to do 200 years ago. Miss Price. My God. (coughs) 200 years ago, I wouldn't even be here. Now I have no way of getting back. Brad. He'll never manage without me. I don't even know if he's still... (coughs) We made the world so much smaller. Thought we were so clever. Nobody ever thought what would happen if it suddenly got big again. Come back to the lounge, please. Don't go out there. Oh, John. 
Are you really going to try to stop me? If, if you go through those doors, I'm not sure I can allow you back inside. Don't be ridiculous, John. <coughs> I'm sick. Everybody's sick. Everybody except you, and you already had it. There's nothing your quarantine can achieve now. Miss Price, come back. I'm actually going to do something. <coughs> it feels good. You should try it sometime. If I thought there were anything to be done, Miss Price, I would. Stay there, Teddy. You need to stay in the Land Rover. Now stay. I'm sorry, I... I can't help them anymore. This is the only thing I can do. Mr. Stevens, your poor dad, he died last night. Everyone else down in the village. Dead or gone. I don't know. I'm on my own. All on my own. I can't take care of you all. You're all suffering. You're all dying. This way's easier. I'm sorry, but I can't do anything else. And when I'm done, I'll find someone. There's got to be someone. Someone in the city. Now you stay over there, Ted. I've got to do this. Can anyone hear me? Oh, there you are. Miss Price, please wait. The look who cowboyed up. Oh, what? <laughs> you followed me. <coughs> I, there was little else to do. What have you found? Nothing. I'm sorry. Perhaps it's best if I get you back inside. Everyone's gone, John. Everyone? Everyone. Apart from the ones who didn't make it. They're starting. <coughs> I couldn't stand the smell. Oh. Yeah. I did find these, though. Keys. Dozens of them. Labeled with all the codes. <coughs> we had X2 floor plans for the whole airport. In Central Security, I matched some of them up with the codes. Look, I think you can get into the control tower. I, I really don't think we should. There must be a way of making contact. Co get radio transmitters, calling the states. I don't believe it works that way. I, I don't no, think... I want to try it. <sighs> Miss Price, please, you're sick. Come back <coughs> inside the bar. I'll make you comfortable. I am sick of that terminal. There's got to be a way. In the tower, we can send her an SOS. Oh, tomorrow, let's find try a way. tomorrow. I, I need to do another round of the lounges. I've... No one left to move the bodies. John, I may not have it tomorrow. I shouldn't leave the terminal. <coughs> instructions were to keep the people inside the terminal. You just said it yourself. There's only you and me left who can still walk. And I feel lousy. Oh, Miss Price. Maddie, please. <sighs> While I've got the strength, let's try it. Go up the tower. <coughs> what have we got to lose? If nothing else, we'll have a great view. If there's anything out there... <coughs> Anything at all. Only appropriate personnel have permission to enter the tower. I don't have the authority to... I won't tell. <coughs> uh, nine floors, what are my chances? Come on, John. Live dangerously. <coughs> Might be our only hope. But, but wait. But wait. Miss Price. You're home. I've brought you back to them. 
I'm sorry, House. I didn't know what else to do. Transistor radio. Batteries. That's the only power we've got left now. I suppose there is something I can do. Record this. Report the story. One day, someone will want to know. There must be somebody left. Somewhere in this world. People who want to know. Good night, Elsa. Sleep tight. Mm. <laughs> oh, what happened? It was too much, Miss Price. You fainted after all those stairs. Oh, I, I, I never faint. Oh. A pity. I'm not sure it was worth the effort after all. There must be a backup generator. That's why the lights are still on. And I think this is a public address system. Are, are those printers? Telex machines, telegraphs? Can we get them? No a longer word active, at? I'm afraid. Besides, I don't have a number for anyone. Do you? No. No, I don't think so. What hath God wrought? Excuse me. A quotation from the Book of Numbers. Four words sent over a hundred years ago by Samuel Morse. What hath God wrought? The first message ever relayed by means of telegraph. I was just thinking they'd be rather appropriate as the last. What are those printouts? Oh, uh, telegraphs, uh, telexes, transcripts of radio messages. The last panicked cries as they realised uh, civil aviation authority stations across the country were sending them here. Hampshire, Ireland, monitoring incoming and outgoing flights up until several days ago anyway. Status reports, uh, May Days. What do they say? <coughs> I don't think they're of any help to us. That one, <coughs> in your hand, read it. It's a summary of an SOS uh, picked up by the air traffic service at Prestwick, Scotland, covering the North Atlantic. Uh, they sent it on via telex. People here had started recording these incidents, uh, collating them. This was one of the last before. Here, Miss Price, you can see for yourself. John, I can't focus. Please read it. Um, <clears throat> Flight Tango Golf 651, Transglobal, en route from Washington. Um, it's a little garbled. None of the usual protocols. From the first stewardess, both pilots are incapacitated, she says. Over half the passengers suffering from fever, 18 unconscious, four fatalities. Um, oh, um, half an hour later, the, the one final message. The co-pilot regained consciousness. He reported that they were ditching the aircraft less than 100 miles off the coast avoid contamination, to avoid civilian casualties. He thought they might come down on a population centre. There were 152 souls on board when they went into the sea. Oh, oh no. <coughs> it hurts. Oh, under my arms. Miss Price. Uh, Maddie, please. If it's the end of the world, John, I think we can lose the formalities. Miss Price? Maddie? Here, let me... The end of the world. You're right, Miss Price. I think it's time these people knew the truth. 
That is, if there's anybody left to listen. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? Real number one. My name is Daniel Connor, and this is my story. got to be prepared to fail 99% of the time and you got to put yourself in that mindset if you don't then sometimes you cross to the dark side and that is really sad subject found is a series of found recordings from our extensive private collection it contains some of the most mysterious and macabre files and recordings ever gathered and we will release them for your consideration we do not validate their claims, but share them to allow you to make up your mind about who we are and what our collective, veritable truth actually is. Subject Found is a bi-weekly audio drama. Each episode is sequential, so if you haven't listened to the earlier episodes from this season, we encourage you to do so now so you don't miss anything. Last episode, Jared Strong met with local zoologist in Tumwater, Washington, to discuss the attraction of the natural habitat the Pacific Northwest provides various species, including Sasquatch. This episode, his investigation continues at one of Washington State's most dominant natural features, Mount Rainier. I'm Jared Strong, and this is the second recording in the series I'm making to document my hunt for Sasquatch. Yesterday, I met with zoologist and friend Peter Beckingham, and hopefully the ecological and historical information he provided about this part of Washington State was helpful to listeners who aren't familiar with the area. Though most people familiar with Sasquatch won't have seen it as much of a revelation, I wanted to frame this investigation for people new to the topic so they can understand why Sasquatch has made the Pacific Northwest its home for at least as long as humans have been documenting their local giant apes. With that foundation established, I wanted to start exploring some of the evidence for Sasquatch's existence, but on my way to meet with Peter yesterday, I got a call from Andrew Porter, 
a park ranger at Mount Rainier National Park, 370 square miles of intense national beauty in the western half of the Evergreen State. Andrew asked me to come out because of a sighting. Recent history at Rainier isn't exciting. There hasn't been much activity out there. But there were a few reports he wanted me to be aware of. I think there might be more he's not sharing yet. I'm not sure why. But I can take a guess that whatever he has for me isn't something someone with a career wants to share over an open phone line. So I'm on my way out to the park now. I'll check back in as I get closer. Well, I just spoke with Andrew, and he's going to meet me at the ranger station next to the Henry M. Jackson Visitor Center. I hope I find a parking spot up there. If you've never been but plan on going, here's a piece of advice. Get there early, unless you don't mind walking around the mountain to get to the mountain. It takes forever to get through the park to this particular visitor center, which is about as close to the summit of Rainier as humanity has established itself. Any higher, and it's just you and the mountain. The unforgiving mountain. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has for me. I've never met Andrew, so I have no idea who he is, but he said he found me off the Facebook page. I didn't know anyone even looked at the page, so it was nice to find out that it served some purpose, wasting the precious little time I have to update the damn thing once in a while. Well, I'm pulling up to the visitor center now. I'll start recording again when I find Andrew. Andrew? I take it you're Jared. <laughs> That's me. Thanks for your time. Mind if I record this? Well, I did agree to it. Yeah, you did. I just wanted to make sure it was still okay with you, legalities and all that. Look, I get it. I'm sure you've got to be careful with that. I have to be careful with everything. Are you a believer? In Bigfoot? Hardly. But... You called me specifically because of something you've got? Something you think I need to see? Let's go to my office. I'd rather we talk there. Would you like anything to drink? What do you have? Coffee and water. <laughs> Not much of a selection. Tight budget? Well, in the park we survive on coffee. It gets cold and boring out there. And the water? Eh, just to rehydrate. We don't have much in the way of medical expertise except what we can do for ourselves. So any way we delay or avoid needing medical help, we do it. Coffee would be great. And here you go. Thanks. So, what needs to happen for someone who doesn't believe in Sasquatch to call someone who is actively pursuing evidence for the existence of Sasquatch? Well, these. What's this? Reports. Our stations have taken in over the past few months from all around the mountain. All of these? There have to be... 75 reports. Didn't want you having to count all those. I appreciate it. This is strange. Sightings have been so rare out here for years. Well, what you've got in your hands disproves that. I'm not sure why, but these have been held back. Held back? Look, sorry, that's all above my pay grade. You should find a lot of information in those. I don't know what you can get from it, but I figured it'd be something useful to you. Some are sightings, some prints, some are crazier. What do you mean? Well, last week, some hikers claimed they came across Bigfoot. And they claim that they actually interacted with it. Which 
report is that? The report on top. I thought you'd want to see that one first. This is remarkable. <laughs> if it's real. You don't believe they saw this? I don't believe a large ape stopped to have a conversation with a group of hikers. No. This report doesn't say that. It says that... Look, I was being flippant. It's pretty remarkable, maybe too remarkable. How long have you worked the mountain? Man, it's been seven years. (laughs) I started working for the service right after college. But I've been here since. It's got to be a great job. That's all right. I mean, the mountain is great. It's beautiful. It's just... Not what you expected? (laughs) Uh, No, no, not really. I think I sort of rushed myself into a career decision and figured I could make a bigger impact than I actually am. I've been hunting Sasquatch for 20 years. I can tell you that park services, rangers, forestry... All of you have made a very positive impact on the collective psyche about our natural resources. I don't want to think about where we'd be if it wasn't for people like you doing what you do. Thanks. You know, I I think I had delusions of grandeur when I decided to follow this path. I don't know what I was thinking, but it, it is what it is. I can't change that now. But if I'm able to help others, that's cool. I've made my peace with the fact that I'm not going to change the world. Don't lose that dream yet. You're young. Plenty of time to shake the world awake. Is that why you're reaching out to me now with these reports? Even if you don't believe Sasquatch exists? If this thing exists, and if these people are telling the truth, I don't want to stand in the way of truth. If these things are out there somewhere, it's my duty to the service to facilitate their study. You know, I did a lot of reading up on you. You're all over the internet and well-respected, at least by anyone who isn't a scientist, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, well, I gave up caring about what they thought a long time ago. Man, it's got to be hard doing what you do. Depends on how you define hard. I enjoy it. It's a passion. It drives me regardless of what doubters and naysayers think. And I appreciate people like you who put aside personal feelings about Sasquatch in order to help. Mind if I ask why you do this? I don't imagine it pays very well. No, money is the last of my considerations, trust me. My reasons are silly, to be honest, but it is what it is. Childhood trauma has a way of doing that, of taking something that is pretty trivial and marking you in a way that drives you for the rest of your life. Hmm. You know, I get it. I mean, I didn't dream of being a park ranger when I was a kid. I wanted to be an astronaut. But I can understand what you're saying. I have friends who went through some really messed up stuff when we were kids, and it definitely makes them the adults they are today. Mind if I ask what happened? I mean, I'm sorry if that's inconsiderate. My supervisor keeps telling me I've got to be less direct with people. You know, my mother used to always say that too. But I thought she was just nitpicking, you know, like mothers can. I don't mean to be rude. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. I don't mind. But you've got to promise you won't laugh. Oh, scout's honor. I didn't think park rangers were considered... Boy, in here, I thought I had a bad sense of humor. Huh? Oh, geez. Yeah, I missed that one. What makes me do this? It's a long story. Covers most of my childhood and adolescence, in fact. I'll give you the short version. My family was a camping family, outdoorsy types. We'd camp all summer long, every other weekend at least. My father loved getting away from Seattle and back into nature. He grew up in a small town between Olympia and Portland and moved to Seattle for school and never left. He loved the city. We all did. But he had to get away from it from time to time. He used to say that camping allowed him to breathe again. We used to go to a campsite near Lake Cushman. It was my father's favorite place, and it sort of became our home away from home because we went there so often. Are you familiar with it? You know, I can't say I've ever been out to the Olympics. I'm more of a Cascadia man myself. (laughs) Well, 
Most of the sites are private with heavy coverage and undergrowth, so you really felt like you were away from the world, really out in the wild. The lake is tucked up against the southeast corner of Olympic National Park. Very picturesque, but also very private. You feel like you're on the edge of a vast wilderness, which, of course, you sort of are if you're looking in the right direction. My mother never got used to that isolation. Her and Dad used to get into some very interesting discussions, they would call them, about going out there. But she always went, complaining the whole way, only to talk about how much she enjoyed her weekend as we'd drive back to the city. There was one weekend where the forecast wasn't looking promising, but Dad said he really needed to get away, really needed to unplug. So we went, and the campground was nearly empty. Funny thing about Americans, isn't it? Even when we want to rough it, we need perfect conditions to do so. Oh man, that is so true. (laughs) Yeah, I guess you would know that. So we were enjoying the site, enjoying the peace that comes with a nearly vacant campsite, and just unwinding. We woke up Saturday morning and headed down to the lake to do some kayaking and swimming. When we came back to the campsite hours later, it was destroyed. Your campsite was destroyed? It looked like a group of drunk teens came through and tore everything up. Our coolers were thrown across the site. The fire pit looked like something had run through it, tossing ash everywhere. One of our tents had been yanked from the ground and was shredded. We tried to salvage all the food we had and set camp back up again. My father was irate. Mother asked him if we could leave, but it was getting late and he'd been up late the night before and enjoying the evening. He didn't think we could make it back safely and he was sure it was just stupid kids, he said. Mom wasn't too happy about that. It was a long night. We were quiet all evening as we ate and tried to distract ourselves with card games. My dog, a six-year-old collie, was being ridiculous. His name was Sam, and he just wouldn't lie down. just kept pacing. It annoyed the hell out of me. We tried to settle in by watching the fire for hours. As a young kid, I don't remember everything, but I do remember just wanting to go to bed and get the night over. So I did, but not before my mother asked my father to keep the fire hot. They argued a bit because he didn't want to be up late and she didn't want to be without the fire and the safety it provided. It was obvious she was scared. I didn't understand why, but I could feel it from her. She was usually so steady. I don't know how long I'd been sleeping when Sam started whining. He always slept in the tent with me. It was a three-person tent, but with all my gear and clothes and Sam inside, it was a pretty tight fit. His fidgeting bugged the hell out of me. I remember telling him to lie down, but he kept standing up and whimpering. He was looking towards the tent flap and pacing in any sliver of space he could find. It was late, though I'm not sure how late. Suddenly, Sam started losing his mind whimpering like I was beating him. Then all of a sudden he laid down, his head between his paws, and got real quiet. I had this sudden fear. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to turn my flashlight on. I was frozen, not daring to make a sound. To this day, I don't know why I felt like that. I just did. I laid there and didn't move a muscle except to reach for Sam. I thought I was trying to comfort him, but now I know I was really trying to comfort me. That's when I heard the growl. There was something outside my tent. I could hear it moving, grunting, and and it tossing our stuff around. My parents unzipped their tent, a flashlight came on, and my father started yelling. Years later, he told me he was trying to scare the camp invader. Did it work? Not at all. All at once, the camp went from silent to absolute chaos. My father was yelling, my mother was screaming, and whatever was out there howled. It was ungodly. That howl. I'll I'll never forget that sound. I had to unzip my tent. I had to get out. 
it, I felt trapped. Like whatever was out there was going to discover me and I'd have nowhere to run. I figured if I was out of the tent, at least I could escape. Childish, I know. There was so much commotion outside. I, I couldn't get my tent unzipped quickly enough. The zipper kept getting stuck because I was shaking so badly. My mother, my mother kept screaming. I finally got the tent unzipped and Sam bolted out. I I reached for him, but once he had his mind set on something, that was it. I scrambled after him, not thinking about anything else, but my mother grabbed me before I ran more than a few feet. She was hysterical. I was little. I wasn't going to break free. She made sure of that. Even as dark as it was, I could make out enough of what was going on because my father had his flashlight and a lantern in the dirt and it lit up enough of the sight. Enough to see our visitor. You never forget the first time you see a Sasquatch. Wait, you saw one of them? (laughs) Everyone's a skeptic until they see a Sasquatch. From that day on, we all believe. My father was waving his arms wildly, using his tactical flashlight like it was a damn lightsaber. The Sasquatch was on the edge of the site near where we'd left our cooler. I remember it looking... (laughs) bewildered. It must have been trying to figure out what the hell my father was. That's when I noticed Sam. He may have been frightened initially, but not now. He was a completely different dog. His hackles were raised as he stood between my father and the Sasquatch. Crouched down on his front paws, he was ready to pounce. The Sasquatch was growling, but so was Sam. That damn dog just wouldn't back down. It didn't matter that the Sasquatch was ten times his size. Sam was not letting that thing harm us. I remember hearing other campers coming, complaining about some stupid college kids. But when a few of the men stomped into our sight, ready to give us a piece of their mind, they saw that thing, and immediately... I've never seen grown men collectively cower. Sam was barking viciously, maybe feeling emboldened by the presence of a small army of humans. Whether it was Sam's increased aggression or the fact that all these people... I I don't know, but the Sasquatch suddenly turned and leapt into the trees... That's when Sam went after him. (laughs) That little bastard had so much fight in him. My mother wouldn't let go of me no matter how much I struggled. I fought, I cried, but she wouldn't let me go. She knew what my young mind was thinking. My father knelt in front of me and assured me Sam would be back any minute. I could hear his barking becoming more distant as he chased that thing through the forest. I kept waiting for him to turn around. He didn't, though. Just before his barking completely faded, I heard him yelp. And then, nothing. No one was going into those woods. I can understand it now, of course, but as a kid, I hated all those men and my own father for being cowards and not saving Sam. The next morning, the campground staff called in rangers and They found him after a few hours of searching. I was an adult before my father would tell me the truth about what happened. For years, he told me Sam had apparently fallen into a pit and broke his neck, dying suddenly, that he'd felt no pain. But when I was older and my parents thought I was ready to hear the truth, my father let me know what the rangers had actually found. Dad said it horrified them. I guess they said it looked like something had torn Sam in half and just discarded him on the forest floor. And that's what set me on this course, believe it or not. Told you it was stupid. No, 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 I I get it. You were young, and, uh, and honestly, dogs are pretty cool. I'm not much of a cat person. They make lousy, terrible company. <laughs> Hey, this, you know, this, this might be good news for you then, but, uh, those reports, they're, they're not all that I have for you. Oh? Yeah, and, um, 
You know, if you like, I can, uh, I can take you up to the site. Where these people saw the Sasquatch? No. Where I did. Over the past 20 years, I've seen a lot of conversions. Seeing a Sasquatch will change the hearts of even the most staunch skeptics. But Andrew was especially guarded. Understandably so. I wanted to carefully manage my reaction. He was young, young enough to be worried about protecting his career options. I've come to know plenty of rangers and forest service personnel, and I can tell you that they are just like the rest of us, a mix of principled skeptics and unabashed believers. There are also people with responsibilities, car payments, and mortgages. And admitting to something like this would need to be done with caution, at least for those who valued their career. Now that I know this part of his personal mystery, I'm very glad I accepted his invitation. Convert stories are some of the most powerful evidence for anthropologists, zoologists, cryptozoologists, and hunters of Sasquatch like me. I couldn't wait to see what he had to show me. I wasn't sure if Andrew bought my story about Sam or not. I've recited it enough times over the years, at public gatherings, in Bigfoot enthusiast groups, and even to curious strangers to make it believable. Or at least I think I have. But some people are very perceptive. Maybe that was why he shared as much as he did with me. But if Andrew saw through my veneer, he was kind enough not to say anything. For now, I'm going to shut down this recording and get it packaged for you. When I'm done tonight, I'm going to have a cold beer in honor of Sam. All quotes that you hear at the beginning of each episode are provided by Steve Mojo Wilkins of the Washington Sasquatch Research Team. You can find more of Steve's work over at WASRT.net. And I would like to thank Steve for his time on educating me on what it's like to find Bigfoot. Subject Found is a pulsating production in association with Fate Crafter Studios. This episode was written and edited by Paul Sading. It was produced by Brian Bristol. Join us in episode 3 as Jared wraps up his visit at Mount Rainier with Andrew and then responds to a sighting out in Forks, Washington. We will also look at the etymology and zoology of Sasquatch, so be sure to join in. If you have any sightings you would like to report, Please email us at foundtapespodcast at gmail.com and we'll make sure we get it into Jared's hands. You can find more information about Subject Found at foundstories.com. Also, check out some of the other Fate Crafter shows such as Diary of a Madman at madmandiary.com, Atheist Apocalypse at atheistapocalypse.com, and the You Are Here podcast at youareherepodcast.com. John McLean is Jared Strong. You can find more of John's work over at jmacvo.com and at dogandponystudios.net. David Curry plays Andrew Porter. You can find David on his YouTube show, This Atheist Life, and on the Atheist Apocalypse podcast. Music in this episode was licensed to use with permission and was created by Chris Collins at indiemusicbox.com. If you would like to become a patron of Subject Found so that we can continue this investigation into this season's lost tapes and to bring you more newly discovered tapes in the future, you can. And we appreciate it by going over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sating. P-A-U-L-S-A-T-I-N-G. Each and every gesture of support is truly, truly appreciated. And there's also some cool benefits in there for you. Lastly, go over to foundstories.com and find out how you can subscribe to the show so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're out on the internet, why not leave a rating and review for the show? We love those five-star ratings. They go a long way toward the show being found by other people who might enjoy it as well. And it's a nice way to help the show out. We really appreciate when people do take time to go do that for us. Until episode three, remember... 
all that is lost must be found. And that's this week's show. See you next week for our 500th. Oh, yes, you've only got six days left to leave us mail and messages for our 500th at sonicsociety at gmail.com. So until then, I'm David Alt. And I'm Jack Ward. Good night. Good night. Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.